Chicago, this is just because we're now talking about Pinterest, but um, <laughs> when it first came out, there were these two Chicago Bulls announcers on TV, and uh, they said, yeah, we follow us on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinerest. <laughs> He's like, that must be a new one. <laughs> oh, my God. So, my cousin used to call it P-interest. Okay. P-interest. Um, that's just a little side note there. Um, <laughs> Who else had their hand? I'm sorry, do you want to share? Um, Please. And the same reason also is to, you know, to learn and to um, become closer. Yeah, and I love when Father John, like if you've been to some of his services where before the reading, he kind of set the tone of, yes. you know, here's yeah. what's actually happening, you know, when they actually wrote this or mm -hmm. here's the time going on. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome. So, what we really can get, gain from it though is in Romans 10 17 says that so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And, you know, I believe that God speaks to us in the silence of our hearts. And a great time that we can reflect on that and meditate is when we read his holy word, that he can actually be talking through us. Not only other people, obviously, and those moments where you just have that God moment and that epiphany, but I believe a lot of it comes from opening up this book for, for that app. And for the past 50 years, right, you always keep hearing, you know, that the Catholic Church keeps urging us to make Bible readings a regular part of our lives, just like our other non-denominational brothers and sisters that were sort of armed, uh, not necessarily to combat them and have a battle going on, like uh, attacking each other, but that we just are grounded with a stronger foundation of knowing what God, you know, has told us through these stories, through these examples, through the prophets that wrote many of the verses in the Bible. So what I wanted to just talk about real quick is, you know, the Bible, number one, it reveals God's Son, Jesus Christ, who experienced death and goes in a penalty for our sins. Can somebody read John 20, 31, if you don't mind opening it up? Yeah. 
my moments to take a quick coffee break. Coffee right. in Christ. That's how I do it. John 20, 31. <clears throat> yeah, um, just the verse 31. Yeah, yeah, please. Now, since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and they be taken down. Thank you. And, I mean, you guys all know what John 3.16 says, you know, for God is only son, um, know that we might have life. And just knowing that life comes through reading and gives us more life, that it, it's just more incentive for us to come to all the truth and can to read this. Uh, the Bible is inspired by God and it's without error. Can somebody read 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17? 2 Timothy. Yes, you said John 20, 31. Oh, did you read the wrong one? I don't know. My, this is not a Catholic Bible. This is a Christian Bible. Is it right? Yeah, that might be. Okay. I, <laughs> Which one did you read? <laughs> you might just read, read it. Listen, John 20, 31. Where's yours? I have something to read that only serves. Yeah. Verse 31. Hmm. I know it's over there. 20, 30. Yeah, so I read the wrong Oh, okay. That's, yeah, that's okay. All right. Don't worry. I was sorry. 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 I and that through his belief, this belief, you may have light in his name. Okay. Yeah. More or less saying the same thing, but that one's a little I bit more, a little bit more graphic. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that we have we'll more life <laughs> through reading scripture. Oh. That, that's perfect. Now, Second Timothy, though, that the Bible is inspired by God without error. So, Second Timothy, chapter three, sixteen and seventeen. Do you already have it? Yeah, please. Thank you. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reputation, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Yeah. And I think the main thing to get out of this is that, you know, how much we we know from scholars and different research that the Bible we believe is without error. And there's been so many different years and years and years of you know honing it down into what it is now um, that we believe that it is the truth and inspired by God. The Bible changes lives. Um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Someone put that one up. The word of God is alive and active, that, mm -hmm. yeah, and kind of right. sharper than any double-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where the soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and thoughts of the heart. Beautiful. Cuts right to the soul core, right? And, quick side note, how does God make tea? He brews it. Okay. Uh, the Bible also delivers God's truth in ways that we can understand. Can somebody read Colossians 3.16? Colossians 3.16? That it delivers truth in ways that we can comprehend. I won't make you guys look up too many more verses. No, this is good for Chapter 3, me. verse 16. Uh, who is it, right here? Or, oh, okay. Um, you got it right here? You want to read it? It's yeah, right please. Right. Okay. <laughs> Chapter 3, is verse 16. Old Testament? It's a different version. Old Testament. Yeah, Let no. the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives, teaching counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. 
sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. Nice. And I guess what I, what I take out of that verse particularly is how it's saying that it's not just for us to read this, it's for us to then go and teach others, right? And then we have to continue to give. Acts 20, 35 really touches on that too, that it's better to give and to receive. So I want to play a quick clip. Um, I'm going to play a couple of these segments um, throughout our time today. But the idea behind this is, you know, it just kind of sheds more light on the history of the Bible, you know, how it came to be. And hopefully we'll enlighten some of your hearts to uh, have a little bit more knowledge about what we're talking about here. So let me go to our first clip here. <coughs> Trilogy, which has sold over 50 million copies, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, at 85 million sold, and The Lord of the Rings Trilogy, which has sold over 150 million copies. But more than 4 billion copies of the Bible have been distributed. Every year, over 100 million copies are sold or given away. It's been translated into more languages than any other piece of literature. The YouVersion Bible app has been downloaded over 250 million times and supports over 1,000 languages. The Bible is the best-selling book of the year, every year. It's the most popular book of all time. For many people, the Bible is their most precious possession. And the Bible is so powerful that some dictators and governments have even outlawed it. People risk fines, imprisonment, and severe punishment just to smuggle it into certain countries. And some of them even risk their lives to share its message with others. I heard the story of Miriam and Marzea who risked their lives to share their faith in their home country. They would walk for miles, house to house, every night, and they put New Testament Bibles in people's mailboxes. After three years and 20,000 Bibles being delivered, they were found out and arrested. Miriam remembers the day that Marzea was arrested, and the police came to the door with her. Suddenly I heard the sound of her with a few others behind the door. Well, I saw her standing there with um, three guards. And I was so shocked when they ransacked everywhere and they took both of us with all our belongings, like Bibles, Jesus movies, into the security police. We had long hours of interrogation. I, I believe it was in the first day that he threatened us to physical torture. In that dark cell in the basement, we just hugged each other, we said goodbye, because we thought it was our last day on earth and um, we were so scared. I remember the only thing that we could do um, in that dark cell in those moments was just praying for each other. We spent almost nine months in prison and 14 days we were separated, we were um, staying in solitary confinement. And I can say uh, during those nine months we had almost about 10 trials, 10 courts. And in each court the judges our, and our interrogators would threaten us to execution by hanging and they, they wanted to put pressure on us to deny our faith in Jesus. We didn't have Bible with us, but uh, we learned how to live with the verses uh, of Bible. And every day we were praying and uh, asking God to give us uh, this power to live uh, those verses and to show him through those, uh, uh, through our behaviors to prisoners. It was um, almost uh, uh, at the nine months that uh, uh, we heard that uh, we, have, we had many supports from different uh, parts of the world. And because of all these uh, supports, the, the government had to release us, unlike their desires. I remember uh, it was two years ago, we were in Australia and we were invited to a church. We, after our speech, um, a couple came up uh, on the stage and they were, uh, both of them, they were crying and they started to share their stories. They said that um, the wife found one of those Bibles that they put in, the, in their mailboxes and they found the Bible and the whole family came to Christ just by reading that um, New Testament that they put in their mailboxes. But when I look at this too, you know, the key part that I took away from this story at least um, was how they didn't have the physical copy of the Bible, but they had it within their hearts. And it was something that got them through this very, very difficult time. 
So it's, you know, this one little poem says, The Bible worker imprints the cover sought from use. Its pages rubbed and wrinkled, the binding coming loose. And even if this Christian and her Bible were apart, she still would have it with her, hidden in her heart. This other verse by Charles Spurgeon, he says that a Bible that's falling apart usually belongs to someone who isn't. You guys kind of relate to that, or what do you think? Yeah, right. Or ideally that your phone's got a lot of fingerprints on it from swiping through the Bible, right? Or, or just, you know, things that are going to bring us closer to our faith. And yeah, I mean, that's the reality that things like P interest and other apps like that are going to really bring us to see that. So let's continue that video because this kind of continues to shed some light on what we're here today for. So, what is the Bible? The Bible is a book, or more accurately, it's a collection of books. The word Bible comes from a Latin word, Biblia, which means books or library of books. It's divided into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the larger of the two and includes what was written before Jesus lived. The New Testament is what was written afterwards. Together, the Old and the New Testament were written over a span of around 1,600 years by at least 40 different authors. Kings, scholars, tax collectors, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, historians, teachers, prophets, and doctors. There were different types of literature, like history, poetry, prophecy, and letters. The Bible is 100% the work of human authors, but Christians believe it's also 100% inspired by God. So how can that be? One of the greatest English architects, Sir Christopher Wren, is best known for building St. Paul's Cathedral in London. He was the chief architect on the project, which took about 36 years to finish. As the architect, he carefully planned where each stone should go. And even though he never laid a stone himself, no one would dispute the fact that he built it. Sir Christopher Wren was the inspiration behind it all. In a similar way, with the Bible, there are many different writers, but one architect, one inspiration behind it all. God himself. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, All scripture, referring to the Bible, is God-breathed. In other words, all scripture is inspired by God. The Bible isn't a random collection of writings. It's God's message of love to the world. It's a timeless story, whether it's true or not, is a, to everybody's own opinion. The Bible is so controversial, a bit of wisdom, isn't it? <laughs> it's a good history, but I think people take the Bible way too literally. I guess a lot of people are lost in the world, and the Bible helps them like, find meaning. It represents a path that people are supposed to follow. Just a book, man, if you want to read it, you read it, but... Because people's opinions, people's opinions complicate everything. I feel like the purpose of it has been taken a bit. Give people something to believe in. Yeah, absolutely. To form some sort of unity. I think the Bible is a guide on how to live. Guidance. Guidance is just the same way as any holy book. If that's what you want to abide by and if that's the way that you want to live your life, then I think that absolutely it has a purpose. So, what do you think the purpose of the Bible is today? or? as it relates to your life or just in general, what do you guys think would be the purpose? Moral uh, compass. Moral compass? Yeah. yeah. That's a good answer. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, I had tried to read it a long time ago and I picked it up recently it was just to read the New Testament because I started yeah. trying to start with the Old. Right, right, right. So I started with the New. And I found it interesting. I haven't made it very far and actually it's gotten my size since my husband on as deployment, but I found it very interesting. Um, it helped me better understand the readings yeah. in church because I never had read an entire book from, so I read Matthew from the beginning to the end, and it kind of put a new perspective on the yeah. readings. I'd only ever heard the snapshots, like a little here, a little here. Put it like in the context, church. more or less. Yes, yeah, so I better, I had, I got a lot more out of listening to the readings in church. Okay. Yeah. I, I tell my daughters uh, this phrase, a smart person learns from their own mistakes, but a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. So if you read the Bible, if a person could do it and screw up their lives or do something virtuous, it's in there. I, right. I, you know, somebody can find a passage to support any person, human action or inaction. 
So Beautiful. I mean, it's 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 a great book. Believers and unbelievers, great book. Yeah. And that leads perfectly into our first handout. So the I don't know if you guys is that where you have now? Okay. Um, let's go back up to here so we can make sure it's it. So I thought this was a good swell. You guys have already seen this before, but um, so you, you say that says. So there's a lot of things that we can relate to, whether it's, you know, that I'm too tired or nobody loves me, I'm not smart enough, I, I, I can't go on, I can't manage. And for some people, these are 24 7 types of feelings. Some of the people, it's different stages of, of our lives, right? So what's really cool about this is that there's a Bible verse that can sort of substantiate what God is trying to say to us when we're feeling that things are impossible. He's saying, no, all things are possible. When we can't go on, my grace is sufficient. So could somebody read uh, Hebrews 13.5? The one where it says, I feel alone, but I will never leave you. I think that's a huge one. So many times we feel alone, that we have to go alone. We never have to. In our Savior, we help carry this cross. So what it says about us is we need help too. We need others and we need him. Hebrews 13.5. Uh, should be. Should be. Okay. Yeah, you can Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, "I will never fail you. I will never abandon." Any, any other line that kind of speaks to someone here? or? What? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Proverbs 31. Which one is this? Or, or just in general? In general. Oh, okay, okay, sure, the sure. List, I'm sorry. No, you're, you're, you're fine, but what's that say to you? That is the one where if you're having a hard day as a mom, where it talks about the most valuable wife in person. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She's the whole thing. Very good. Sometimes I think we can be sharp with our Proverbs time. 31, you said? Yeah. So put a note down here when I feel stressed out as a mom. Yes. That says, it's okay. Proverbs yeah. 31. <laughs> Any other lines, though, from this one, or just in general, that kind of speak to anybody here, or perhaps spoken to in the past? Just one more, this one where it says, uh, I'm not smart enough, but I will give you wisdom. Somebody read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. Let's read the Old Testament too. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 30. Is also kind of similar to this one. A little bit overlap, a little bit different though too, but it's just kind of good food for thought. These are Bible emergency numbers. So they're available 24-7. Phone service is not required. 
Uh, but these are just kind of cool reminders too that you know when you have worry, uh, when you're feeling danger, uh, when you leave home for travel, that was a good psalm there that helps with uh, trying to pray for safety, good intentions. Uh, Paul's secret to happiness, if you want to be fruitful, if your pocketbook is empty, things like that. It discourages about your work, you know, all these types of things that really help you come back to the Lord. Now on, the, now, on this list, is there something that one of you would like to pray for now, or just uh, at least read the Bible verse behind it? Like when the world seems bigger than God, that's probably a... I don't know if you get a guess for that often, but I do sometimes. Um, Psalm 90, can somebody read that? Psalm 90. Do you have it? Mm -hmm. Could you read it? You don't Psalm 90? Yeah, please. Um, Lord, you have been our refuge through all generations. Before the mountains were born, the earth and the world brought forth from eternity to eternity, you are God. A thousand years in your eyes are nearly as yesterday. But humans should return to dust, saying, Return, you mortals. Before a watch passes in the night, you have brought them to their end. They disappear like sleep at dawn. They are like grass that dies. It sprouts green in the morning, by evening it is dry and withered. Oh, that's great, that's great. I mean, sometimes these storms in our life have to happen, right, in order for like, the rainbows to appear and for new life to spring up. It kind of touches on that in that psalm. But I think coming back to what you said earlier about the Bible comforting you, mm -hmm. I just feel like you take a couple seconds and you're feeling like this and you go to the, to the Word and whether you read it out loud or just meditate on it, it just kind of brings you like a sense of relief, even for a, a split second. And I think that's the point of this, right? That we're trying to sometimes calm ourselves back down and you know be and know that there's a bigger picture out there, right? That we are so small in this grand picture, but we're also a very important and intricate part of this picture too. So let's continue with that video. We'll keep talking about that. surprised at what you find. Most likely you'll find yourself in the middle of a story or a letter or a song. Or you'll find practical wisdom and advice for life. In 2 Timothy it says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. The Bible, or God's word, is the highest authority for what we believe and for how we live. It talks about things we deal with every day, like friends, money, work, pain, and happiness. The Bible is a guide. It shows us how to live, and it gives us boundaries. Some might say, I don't want a rule book. If I follow this, I'll lose my freedom. But if there were no boundaries or guidelines in life, our lives would be complete chaos. Think about driving. Boundaries help make it safe for us to drive cars or sports. Sports without rules would be terrible. Canoodles really got to get back on track here after bogeying the 14th. He looks like he's ready to make a shot. Oh, smart move. Another smart move by Carnival. We can find true freedom in our lives when we're in God's will. God doesn't say things like don't murder because he wants to ruin our fun. He says it because he loves us. Jesus summed up all of God's instructions like this. He said, love God and love others. If you've ever tried reading the Bible before, you've probably come across some pretty confusing parts that raise a lot of questions. And if you find it challenging at times, don't give up. Keep on reading. The more you read, believing it's God's word, the more life it will give you, and the more you'll begin to understand the confusing parts. Yeah, that's what I found after reading the Bible over the years. So many of the questions I've had have been answered. Now, I still have lots of questions, but it's a journey. The more I read, the more I understand. Jesus is the key to understanding the whole Bible. 
We interpret scripture through the lens of Jesus. Luke's gospel describes an encounter Jesus had with two of his friends. It was just after his resurrection, and they were walking to a city called Emmaus. As they walked on a road just like this, he began to talk them through the Old Testament. Beginning with Genesis and working his way through, he showed them all the different ways the scriptures were speaking about himself. It's like the entire Bible is one big arrow pointing us to Jesus. And that's the number one thing that God wants to show us, himself. Jesus is the supreme revelation of God. We see more and more of what God is like as we look at Jesus. The Bible is a huge part of our day-to-day -day relationship with God. God has spoken, and God still speaks to us today. In some ways, God's word is like a letter from God. When I get a letter from someone I love, like my wife Melissa, I treasure it, I hold on to it. And it's the same with the Bible. It's special because through it, we hear God's voice. Okay, so if you guys go to the next handout, I might have had it out of order though, I'm just realizing that. Yeah, so go to the one that says my child, top to the one right at the end. Um, have, have you guys already heard this before, this video? Like the, no. uh, the Father's Love Letter? Have you guys ever experienced it? Okay. So. There's books for kids like that. Yeah, yes. and um, we did this as part of our faith lesson with, if any guys have people students in uh, I think it's K through 6, we did this uh, as part of our Christmas miracle season lesson. Uh, but this video is really cool. It's basically just going to, you know, verbatim tell you what's on the sheet. But as you follow along, maybe start off, you know, one of the verses that really speaks to you, um, that you can really relate to. And then we're just going to go around the room afterwards and just kind of share with each other what really inspired us. Or if not, mentally. I was looking for a colored pencil or a highlighter. Oh yeah, yeah. Highlighters are good too. Um, yeah, I have mine all highlighted up too. That's a good idea. I always have a purple pen in my purse. No, I usually have crayons and good. And afterwards I can send out this electronically if you want it. Okay. Was she just grabbing a... Uh, oh, okay. There's markers too. So yeah, this is basically God speaking to us, um, but through Bible verses. So this entire letter is verses from the Bible that will hopefully speak to you. Wait, wait, or just go ahead and play, you think? <coughs> okay, we'll go with it. I mean, I'll just put this next to The words you are about to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And he is the father you have been looking for all your life. This is his love letter to you. Right. 
represented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child.
pray, I try to always start with the thanks. Mm -hmm. And it kind of strengthens my relationship because I feel like I'm knowing that all of my blessings are coming from him. Right. And to just kind of focus on that. So what the students shared with me, um, the one about the hair was pretty important to them. That he knows all the hairs in our head. And I asked a kindergartner, I said, do you know all the hairs in your head? He said, yeah, I do. <laughs> like, okay, well, that's, that's good. But you know, just to, like, they were really um, awestruck too on how he knew the exact time of their birth and the exact location, or, you know, where, we, where we live. Um, the other one that they really liked was like how he knows when we're gonna sit and when we're gonna stand, you know, like like, like exactly when we're gonna sit down or stand up. Um, and then we tied this all into how we're all true miracles. Um, you guys probably saw the board, the bowls, the board, but and I've already told you about that. But basically, you know, all of us on that on our palm hands on their own, with the lines of our hand etched. Um, sometimes on both hands, sometimes just one, but that the M stands for miracle. So the one that really hit home for them when we talked about that was the one about the mistake. That, you know, that, that, that you're not a mistake. Um, so that was just pretty cool for them to see this and uh, to know that all, all their days were also written in his book. You know, one of them was like, you know, that's got to be a pretty big book. Um, and the sands on the seashore, like they've all been to a beach, but they can't imagine that, you know, his, his love for us is more than all the sands on the seashore, which is quite a bit of sand. Just a really cool, cool letter, you know, to remind us of our worth and our value. My so, kids still, look, still look for Oh yeah, for them? Nice. Every time. Oh, good. Well, That's a good reminder. Yeah, mine came home for wet day. Yeah. Uh, my, especially my kids are, this is the first time here. Yeah. Okay. That's right on. Yeah, breeze. Yeah, Isaiah 49, 16, it says, you know, I can raise you up with all of my hands. And um, that's the proof. Okay, one more clip from the other video, and then we got a couple more slides, and I want to just do a quick reflection with you guys, too, on Alexio to be on more or less. tips to help you read the Bible. Our first tip is get a Bible. You may want to ask the host of your Alpha to help you find one. You can also find Bibles online or as an app too. We love the YouVersion Bible app. Okay, the second tip is for you to find a time and place that works for you. For example, if you're a morning person, then you can take 10 minutes in the morning, maybe make some breakfast, and then read a couple of verses. Yeah, or you can listen to the Bible on your way to work or school. Tip number three, when you read the Bible, don't flip and point. Reading a random verse here and there will likely leave you confused and maybe a bit lost. It's best to read it one book at a time. Yeah, but don't feel like you need to start with the first page of Genesis. We recommend starting with one of the Gospels like Mark or John. And to help you get started, we built a few reading plans. Just search Alpha Youth in the YouVersion app. Okay, tip number four. Genre matters. It's important to know what kind of book you're reading. Some books are poetry, others history, while some are letters. Knowing what kind of book you're reading will help you understand how to read it. Tip number five, ask lots of questions. When you read your Bible, ask questions about what you're reading to help you understand the context, like who was it written to and what was happening in your world. Yeah, and then you can ask questions like, what does it mean for us today? And what does it teach us about who God is? Tip number six, pray. One of my friends had written on the edge of her Bible, pray before opening. This meant that every time she went to read her Bible, she was reminded to talk to God about it. Okay, our final tip, tip number seven, is to talk to people. You know, reading the Bible isn't something we should only do alone. Talk about what you're reading with friends, and don't be afraid to ask questions. And those are our seven tips. I remember this one morning before school when I was 14 years old. I was sitting on the floor of my bedroom reading the Bible, and I had just started the book of Jeremiah, and some of the words in the very first chapter, they really stood out to me. This is what it says. I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as my prophet to the nations. O oh, Sovereign Lord, I said, I can't speak for you. I'm too young. 
The Lord replied, Don't say I'm too young, for you must go wherever I send you and say whatever I tell you. And don't be afraid of the people, for I'll be with you and will protect you. In that moment, I felt like God was speaking to me. It was as if the words jumped off the pages. Seeing how God called Jeremiah at such a young age reminded me that God uses young people like I was, who don't always feel confident or qualified. I was filled with this deep sense of purpose by the reality that God knew me before I was even born, and that he had a plan for my life. I remember knowing deep down in my heart that no matter what, no matter how intimidated I was by what was in front of me, that God was with me, that he'd protect me and guide me, just as he promised Jeremiah. Now this moment transformed my life, and I find myself going back to those verses all the time. But here's the thing, most days that I read the Bible, it's not like that. I don't always have a big epiphany, but I found that the daily practice of reading scripture has changed me over time. Over the years, the word of God has shaped me and formed the way I think about God, about myself and others. It's a huge, irreplaceable part of my friendship with Jesus, and I can't imagine life without it. Maybe you've never really tried to read the Bible before, or you haven't in some time. Our hope for you is that you feel like that's something you can give a try today. So, he talks about the U version app. Uh, how many of you guys have that? Did, did someone said that you have the U version? I don't have the U version, but okay, we have a, a a version. Gotcha. Um, so you might have seen the app in the Bible, you know, in the app store. But it looks like this. Uh, they, like they said, it's been downloaded over a quarter of a billion times, over a thousand languages that it's been translated into pretty much every version of the Bible as well. And what's cool about it, and I try to implement this into my life, is every day, you know, in the morning, I open it up and there's a new verse for the day. A lot of times it follows whatever the liturgical season is, you know, so if it's approaching Easter or Christmas, then it's going to be a verse more geared towards that. But um, sometimes it will be more of like a random verse or two or build upon the previous day. What's nice about it is you can either just have that verse be your focus or your meditation for that day, or you can click on it and then start reading the full book or chapter. And if you want to learn more or see, like someone has said too about knowing the context, um, you know, once you know the whole book, the whole story, then that verse makes more sense to you. What's nice about this too for our young people is our Snapchat users out there, um, they actually start giving you like trophies and awards. So more like if you get like a streak going, so if you stay committed to like a 40 day Bible study or a two week program, or you just click on it once a day, you can start growing points, growing awards, trophies, not that we need them or want them ourselves, but for any of you guys that have youth that are approaching the late elementary, middle school age, it's very Snapchat-esque in that sense. And I think it's gonna really help even spur more, more users. And a lot of people too, they'll take like a picture that they give like different images each day on that verse. They'll put it as their picture, you know, on Instagram or Facebook and just share it through social media too. So it's a good teaching point and starting point for any of you guys that have it already or don't have it. It's a great one to get. Um, the next one is a technique. It's called soap. And I have it on the handout here. Or sorry, soaps at the end of this. But these are just a couple more tips. Um, I really like the part where they said you know, pray before opening, where you put that like on your own Bible or uh, set a reminder to, to talk with God each day. It's just kind of a cool concept. Uh, but to read with a pen, you know, my Bible is like very marked up and highlighted and tagged and things like that, like your verse that you knew off the top of your head. Um, key words are really great too. Um, so. And that kind of ties into our Lexio Divina, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. But kind of seeing what phrase or word within that verse or that chapter really speaks to your heart. Um, if and then, or so and that, if you see those uh, types of phrases in the Bible, that's good to, to know like about what's happening, um, different effect phrases. Therefore, if there's a therefore, what is it there for? Um, so usually if that's really... So that's a good sign that Jesus or you know God is trying to teach us something once they start to summarize and say therefore. 
and how does it apply to our lives, to you today, to you particularly. Um, one of the uh, youth ministers that was at the Rainbow Conference when I did this first presentation had said, you know, what this one Bible verse meant to her as a teenager meant something totally different, you know, in your 30s. And so, how does it, how do these things evolve and how do they change and relate to us day to day? And then soap. So every time you read the Bible, you should have a bar of soap in your hand. Right? Mm -hmm. Just you know, feel that piece mm -hmm. of soap and make sure your hands are clean. No, but this is a really cool technique. It's scripture, observations, application, pray. Yeah, so make sure that you're clean and very hygienic well, before you uh, read. No, so scripture, the S part of soap is that you actually pick the verse or a summary to focus on. The observation part is what you see, what stands out. And you know, this part too is kind of like the like so you know, part where you really get into the whole what does the smell look like? What is like how do you really imagine this setting, right? Like the like the sight, the sounds, everything. The application of you know, apply it to your life, attach it to your life, and the prayer, you turn it into a conversation with him. So here's an example. Um, this person chose to focus on Psalm 4, verses 6 and 7. And the scripture part was, many are asking, who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us, O Lord. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and, and new wine abound. So she kind of sort of like summarized like what the scripture was. Then the observations. So many people focus on their circumstances or the people in their circumstances to make them happy. It should be the other way around. My happiness should affect my circumstances. Focus on him who gives me joy. Let the happiness follow. And then she took it a step further. She applied this to her life and said, I should try and do much better not letting stuff affect my happiness. I have joy. That is joy deep in my heart. That reason alone indicates I should be happy all my days on this planet. I need to live like I am saved, by grace and happy about it. And then the other really cool part is a written prayer. And she, so this is the prayer that came out of her reflection on this particular scripture. Thank you, Father, for the reminder of my complete joy in you. Remind me daily to live this life as if I am glad to have it no matter the task I face. In Jesus' most precious name. Amen. So that's the SOAP method. And it's a kind of cool reminder <laughs> as you're reading something, you know, the scripture, application, application, prayer. Any of you guys that saw our recent, the recent March email that I sent um, kind of ties into this story. This is by Diane Stark. In this chapter, she talked about her daughter that had a crush on a boy. And she asked her to place his name in 1 Corinthians 13, 6. Where you, 13, 4 6. Technically 4 8. So she did. And she replaced the word love with Sean. And as she did that, she started reading, you know, Sean is patient and kind. Sean is not envy or both. Sean is not here to get root. Sean is not insistent on his own way. Sean is not irritable or resentful, et cetera, et cetera. And as she did that, she kind of rethought her interest in him. I'm not saying that this has to happen with your children or encourage them to do this exercise. But it's even a better exercise for us is to just take a second and replace, you know, our name. Yeah, down here, first uh, first Corinthians 13, uh, 4-8. And I can send this PowerPoint to you guys too. Um, but you put your first name, like your name in front of each line, and you kind of do a little mini reflection on where am I at, like an evaluation of, you know, where am I meeting God's expectations, where am I falling short? And it could just be an individual, as a parent, as a, uh, as a wife, as, as a friend, you can put yourself in different hats. But I think that's a really important part to remember is, you know, it's just about balance, but also the, the need for us to, especially like during Lent and the seasons where we're, you know, Advent trying to kind of really reflect on where we're at as Christians and as members of the Catholic Church. Where are we surpassing? Where are we needing to improve? You know, for me, like it keeps no record of wrongs. It's, it's, it's tough not to because, you know, somebody wrongs you, it's like, I want to get you back. 
maybe not right away, but eventually, where you just know the words that are gonna get under someone's skin, and you know that's really that's a, a, a you know just a big one for me too. Um, I think the MV one, like the pride thing, a lot of students, you know, they put on that mask and uh, they they show off. And, it, and that's what really gets to some of these kids is they can kind of read through that, but it takes a lot of energy to be someone you're not. And that's the one that really related with them when we did this lesson at the YMCA. Now, what I wanted to get into next, and I don't think I gave you guys a handout for this one. Um, yeah, the other two are just more take home things if you want. But I wanted to, to do a quick Lexio Divina, which means divine reading. You guys have done this before? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this really. I thought about this too um, when Kristen was talking about soul core because a lot of what it is is kind of what you described. And this is a really awesome tool, individually or as a group. Um, but there's four parts to it. So it's the Lexio side, the Meditatio, Oratio, and Contemplatio. But basically the four R's might be easier to remember. Um, reading, reflection, response, and then rest. God's word. And the way this works is you start with the Lexio side of things, and this is where we read the word of God slowly, reflectively, so that it really sinks in. And this could be any passage of scripture, but they have, if you Google this, you know, great Lexio you know, verses, I mean, you'll just get laundry list of like the top ones. I have a PDF that I can send as well, and it's probably the top 50 that I've come across, and I can send that to you guys too. But you really try to let it sink in, that's the first stage. The second stage of reflection is where we think about the text that we have chosen and we ruminate upon it. And ruminate means chew, or where, where we chew on it. You, know, you just chew that, chew it up, you know, like a good beer. You just want to chew it. You, know, you want to really let it, let it really soak in. Right? Um, but yeah, so we really take, try to take from it what, what God wants to give us. We really start to re really reflect on it. Third stage, a radio response, is where we leave our thinking aside and simply let our hearts speak to God. Probably the hardest part of this is where we just let go and let God. And that's not easy because we have an agenda or we have something to do right after we get done with this. And how do we be present enough to let God just speak to us? Fourth stage, contemplative, which is where we rest. So we let go of not only of our own ideas, plans, meditations, but also um, our thoughts, everything. We just rest in the Word of God. And we listen at the deepest level of our being. And as we listen, we are gradually transformed from within. Like one of the co hosts was talking about the reading from Jeremiah that really transformed him. So this is. Lexio Divino in a nutshell. I'm going to read a scripture verse. It's from John chapter 3, verse, um, verses uh, 22 to, to uh, 24. And this is all about more of Jesus, less of me. That's the main theme of this particular scripture passage. And what I want you guys to just keep in mind, for a proper Lexio Divino, they recommend three times. We probably won't have time to go through it three times. But even once, and you really patiently go through it, you can um, you can really let it start to soak, really soak in. And this is an important point because when I did this with the high schoolers at Rainbow, one of the girls, she's like, I think he's saying joy. I think he's saying peace. I'm not sure which word is really speaking to me. And we only did it once, and so that was the that was a huge point to say, then read it again. You know, do this, and then by a third time, you should have that clarity. That's the, that's the idea behind doing it three times. But to, so we're going to read this. I'm going to, ref, and then you're going to reflect on it. You're going to respond in quiet prayer. If you want to jot something down, you can. And then um, just <coughs> rest in God's invitation for you. So, in Jerusalem, Jesus teaches. Nicodemus, and these, uh, this is from soulshepherding.org. Uh, but what's nice about this is they give you a little background of, of like the history. 
before you start reading the passage. So in Jerusalem, Jesus teaches Nicodemus that the kingdom of God is a spiritual reality that you have to be born from above to see. Then he goes to the Jordan River where his disciples baptize people. Some spectators try to draw Jesus and John the Baptist into a competition over who can baptize the most followers. But instead, John promotes Jesus and Jesus withdraws from that area. Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim because there was plenty of water and people were constantly coming to be baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one who you testified about, well, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, A man can receive only what is given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. For the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for God gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned, when the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went, went back once more to Galilee. So, what is one word or phrase that the Holy Spirit impresses on you? What was one word that really spoke to you from that reading? Or phrase? What do you think? Oh, yeah. A man can receive only what he was given from God. so the faith can increase. That's hard to do. The ego, the edging got out, it's hard to let that happen. So we entered into this, you know, but was, wait, what specific situation in your life today re relates to this? Any, any of you? Is there a certain thing that relates to yeah. So the letting go process. Yeah. Um, I'm in the middle of doing a marrying consecration. Yeah. And one of the things is to let you let yourself go into Mary, and so that means like trusting in her will that she will do what's best for you. And to do that, it's like I was telling my husband. I said sometimes I relate my ego to the devil because it keeps me small, right. and to allow that ego to, to go. Yeah. Um, is very challenging. It's like I feel like I have an internal war inside of me, and it, it so letting go is a very hard um, process. Right. I always say that the devil's not coming after couch potatoes. Right. No. He's right. trying to 
a match of people that are really trying to advance his kingdom and advance the Lord's kingdom. Um, just a couple of thoughts, you know, as you're talking about that. Like the last words that Mary spoke in the Bible or, the, or that are recorded in the Bible was at the wedding of Cana, and she said, do whatever he tells you. And those were her final words. And I think it was for a reason, you know, that we are in tune not only to her purity and, and, and what she taught us in terms of unconditional love and, you know, being righteous, but also that we put all that trust in, in our Lord and Savior. And Galatians 2.20 says, you know, that I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And so it's, a, it's, it's, it's like the same sense that we're still alive, we're still breathing, but if we can let go of our own will and our own agenda and everything else, and the more he fills us, the more she fills us, etc., all we can be doing is for him. Right? And so that's a really valid point. Yep. Would you have to say, do you have something? I was checking. Just during the stretch? Say, I have a quote from C.S. Lewis that I have all Oh, yes, please. That that's a good one. C.S. Lewis is a great author of the language and the world, and many yes. other Christian books, too, which yep. I did not realize yep. that I've started to read. It says, don't shine so that others can see you. Shine so that through you, others can see him. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ones that just we were nice. talking about. Well, that one Republic, or like, or like they have like, is it the Republic? They have like hidden messages in their songs. Really? Mm -hmm. Could be. Could be. I, I think yeah. that's the group. Okay. Nice. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you guys know C.S. Lewis was the self-proclaimed atheist. Too, he was. And, yeah. And he found Christianity. That's his pretty. books are based because he used to speak on the radio during the Second yeah. World War, and then his books are based on those talks. It's really yes. interesting. Cool. Because it was a long time ago, but it still relates to absolutely what's going on. <clears throat> so, what is God's personal invitation for you from this scripture? What is He inviting you to do? Especially thinking about this during Lent, right? So, um, that's what we just kind of covered right here. And uh, Psalm 119 says, I have stored up your word in my heart, verse 11, that I might not sin against you. And just that we continue to, you know, speak this, like the more that we teach others, talk about this, it becomes part of who we are. I have a couple other handouts, and those are more just take home a couple other ideas, um, Bible study steps that you guys can take home, uh, as well as a potential Bible study. Uh, it's focused on the miracles of Jesus. It's a 30-day Bible reading plan, but I know they have that interest. Or off of pine rest. Sorry. No, it's so, really, I'm serious. It is a good source. Oh yeah. It, they have a whole Bible journal in some culture. Yep. Where people, that's where I found out about this Bible, where it's got little writings in the margin, and then you color, and it's insane. All the stuff they have on there. I, okay, it's just a side note. I gotta get this. I'm sorry. I'm going over time. Pinterest. Okay, let's just talk Pinterest for a second. <laughs> so my wife, you know, she likes Pinterest. I said, hon, you know, I'm, I have to go, you know, do something. I'll be back uh, in about four or five hours. She's like, that's okay. I'll just Pinterest till you're gone. And I said, or, you know, or, 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 like, till you're home. And I said, how can you Pinterest for five hours straight? And here's, here's the other thing that gets me, okay? How can you go f through it so fast, all right? If it was me, I have to look through each one. Because what if I'm missing something? But I see some people, and they're like, I'm like, what in the heck? How do you guys do it? Like there's so much looking, that's why you spend so much time. Yeah. So that's just a little sign up for me. <laughs> One thing to uh, consider too, so this Lexio Divina, as you guys move into the possibility of soul core and just wings in general, is a group um, 
Lexio Divina. And there's a couple ways you can do this. One is where you just, you know, kind of each person continues to read the passage, like a round robin type thing, and you pause after maybe a couple lines and just silently reflect. And it depends on the group dynamic. And then you go to the next person and you silently reflect. The other option is you go through, you know, this one scripture reading or a few lines of it, and then, okay, which which word is really speaking to me right now? How is this relating to my life currently? And this is a great way to build trust. I mean, you, you, you do this technically through your prayer intentions before the meetings and coming together to pray. But this is also a really good way when you have the um, steering committee meetings and just like the planning meetings to consecrate what you're doing that day. Is a is to really center yourself in Lexio um, and you know where God is leading you on that path. And what you can even do is, you know, if there's a certain theme to that meeting or where you're heading with a certain project or just um, idea, you can Google something that uh, uh, is uh, is along that theme, you know, like a certain scripture. And I'll send that PDF. It's got about 50 of them that I think are the best ones, and have a really good, you know, here's the opening prayer, here's the introduction, and then here's a couple of reflection questions. That being said, any other questions that anybody has for myself? Okay. Thank you very much. Hopefully, I shed a little bit of light yeah. reading the Bible. Good, good.